Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is January 26th, 2024. This video is called God's Judgment Upon Christian Leaders. A few days ago I released a, uh, a video that was called, At Easter, the idle church will be swept to destruction. <clears throat> I urge you to listen to that. Uh, it would be good to listen to it before you listen to this, uh, but if you don't, that's okay. It'll This will make sense to you. I want to start by reading the words of Jesus to the church in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2 from verse 18 to verse 28. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants, to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I've taught a lot about food sacrificed to idols. That's talking about false doctrine. Men have a propensity to interpret the Word of God according to the idols of their heart. God's Word is food. It's our food. And when you sacrifice God's food according to the idols in your heart, you are going to preach corrupted doctrine. And that's what the Church of Thyatira does. It preaches corrupted doctrine and practices sexual immorality. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. Are you a child of the church of Thyatira? There were babies who were dying in 1993 in the year that my wife and I left Metro Vineyard Fellowship. 1993. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Well, who calls the doctrines of Thyatira the deep things of Satan? I do. That's why we left. They were talking about miracles all the time. They were talking about manifestations of the Holy Spirit all the time. And they were simply manifestations of demonic spirits. Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who overcomes and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there are some in the churches of Thyatira, Thyatira including that church in Kansas City known as Metro Christian Fellowship, Metro Vineyard Fellowship, Kansas City Fellowship, uh, Forerunner Church, uh, International House of Prayer. There are some faithful people in that church, but there have been a lot of leaders who have not discerned in the spirit, and there has been one major leader whose name is Mike Bickle, who has shown himself literally to be an unbeliever. 
not only an unbeliever, but an antichrist. One who puts himself in the place of Jesus and who denies Jesus, who contradicts the words of Jesus. On January 7th of this month, 2024, prophetess Christine Beadsworth released a powerful vision that she had had. Part, I'm reading a little bit from the first transcript. She has four, but the first one has the main meat of the vision. And so she recounted a dream that the Lord reminded her of that he had given her at the beginning of 2019, five full years ago. I'm not going to go through all the details. I did that in the first video. But as she recounted that dream, she said, Lord, why was I so shocked in this dream, if this dream is a good thing? And he said, you were overcome with the knowledge that many close to you have not prepared themselves sufficiently. For those who are righteous, my judgments are not something to fear, for they bring recompense and reward. And I said, Lord, all those children were swept away. There were a lot of children swept away in, in a flood, a great flood. How terrible. And he said, yes, my daughter. But my children have played in the river for long enough. Played, played in the river. You know, like uh, a lot of the worship, so-called worship events at IHOP. They should have spent the time preparing and making themselves ready. And I said, what of this dream? Yes, it is the dream you thought of the flood of judgment that comes and is at the door. Oh, I said, so it's a flood of judgment. Not a literal flood. It's both, my daughter. First the natural and then the spiritual. So why did you give me this dream? This morning, Lord, I asked him. I wanted to show you the sequence of timing and the multitudes in the valley of decision. First, the breaking forth, the breaking forth of these seven huge gates of water, floodgates, and then the scooping up of the man-child and passage along the avenue of glory to the garden. What does the hotel represent, Lord? I asked. He said, it is the modern church who feast when they should fast and hold entertainment upon entertainment and lie exhausted from drink in the morning of the day of the Lord. They are the guests at the wedding. The modern church, they are the guests at the wedding. Not the bridegroom, I mean, certainly not the bridegroom, that's Jesus, but not the bride and not the man-child. The man-child are the friends and the brothers of the bridegroom. So that was the dream that I was reminded of when I was walking around the block on the 7th of January, and I said, Lord, what are you saying by reminding me of this dream? What is the connection to nuclear fission? Remember, she had a, also the Lord gave her a vision of a nuclear bomb exploding. And he said, at Easter, the idle church will be swept to destruction. But the watching ones will see and understand what is coming and warn and be led to safety. And I think also, not only will the watching ones see and understand and warn, but they will also lead others to safety. So that was the word, the major word, because later on she says that she's convinced that he's talking about Easter 2024. And so right after this word was released, then I get the news about um, the revelation of the sins of Mike Bickle. 
Now, I don't want to single out only Mike Bickle, but I'm going to focus mainly on that because I know Mike. I was at his churches. I was even a few times at International House of Prayer. I was even advised by Mike to get involved with it because it was going to be huge. And I declined and actually left the Kansas City area shortly after that. But I had already been out of Metro Vineyard Fellowship for seven years by that time. A few months ago, I did a video exposing Greg Locke, <clears throat> not for sexual sin, but uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, outrageous behavior, and for the entire group of leaders and churches known as the New Apostolic Reformation. Look that up, NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, and you will see many big names in the church. And I think, I believe, I personally believe that they are in the same situation as people like Greg Locke and Mike Bickle. I'm not accusing any of them of sexual sin. Mike has been accused of that. I'm going to put a link to a very good video where three men who were past um, leaders in his church talk about what they have found out about the sexual um, sin allegations. Those men's names are Alan Hood, Wes Martin, and Dwayne Roberts. I will put a link to that video here. And then an, another uh, group I want to mention, and I'll put a link to this. This was an AP News article that I read uh, yesterday. It has a date of January 25th that says at least 1,259 people working for the Protestant Church of Germany have committed sexual abuse in the last decades, and at least 2,225 victims were affected by the abuse. The numbers are based on the study of documents and files from the regional churches and the Lutherans' diaconal relief and social welfare organization known as Diaconi. However, the author said that they were not able to analyze the personnel files of all pastors and deacons within the church, but primarily disciplinary files. They estimated that the real number of perpetrators is much higher, with nearly 3,500 people who have committed sexual abuse. And then they say it's the tip of the tip of the iceberg, said Martin Waslowick from Hanover University, who coordinated the study on sexualized violence in the Protestant church in Germany. I think we are only at the tip of the tip of the iceberg with respect to IHOP and with respect to the sins of Mike Pickle. Then <clears throat> another one I want to mention are the millions of spiritually and sexually abused people in the Catholic Church. So the entire church is corrupt. And that's why God said, at Easter, the idle church will be swept to destruction. Let's read about the kind of people that these leaders represent. Or let's say, I'm going to read about a couple of men, three actually, Eli and his worthless sons, who are types of church leadership. So I'm going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. They did not know I am. That's key. These men do not know I am. They have pretended their entire lives that they know God and they have deceived many. But they do not know I am. And when I get, as I read through this, I'm going to explain how you can know if you know I am. A lot of people 
think that they know Jesus. They think they know God. They think that they're saved. They think that they're born again. But they do not know I am. They do not know the Lord. Verse 13. The custom of the priest with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you want. He would say, No, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of I am. For the men treated the offering of I am with contempt. The offering of I am with contempt. What have these young people done who have come to IHOP but offer themselves as maidens, as young men of the Lord, and they have been treated with contempt by those who said they were serving the Lord. Samuel was ministering before I am. He was a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, I am visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy, the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Well, isn't that interesting? Sounds like what was going on at IHOP. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord himself, who can intercede for him? You pastors who have defiled these young women. You have not only sinned against those women. You have sinned against God. But Eli's sons would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of I am to put them to death. Now the little boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says I am, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. He's talking about the Levites. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, I am, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now I am declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there, there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. Now remember Israel prophetically is the church. They were cast out of this land in 
around the year uh, 721 BC. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you both, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. He is talking here. The faithful priest are those of the order of Melchizedek. You need to read the book of Hebrews to understand the order of Melchizedek at all. And there are only 144,000. Whether that's a literal number or not, I don't know, but those are the, that is the number of the overcomers. And they are the ones who God chooses as his priests. They are the order of Melchizedek, and they will minister to God himself. So this is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. That's the house of the Lord. That is New Jerusalem. That is where the fullness of the Spirit of God dwells. And he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. The old priesthood is about to be destroyed. They have been shown wanting. They have not served the Lord in truth and in righteousness. They have not discerned between good and evil. And they have allowed evil to dominate in the church. Before I go on to chapter 3, and I'm even going to read some from chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, I want to take you to Revelation 17 because we need to understand just who this church is. 17.1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman rides the beast because she's in bed with government. She's in bed with the government. She's a 501c3 organization. She caters to the will and the whim of the government and does what the government bids so that she can get all of her money. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. Who are all the prostitutes? Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. On one level, Babylon the Great, the first that would be considered that is the Catholic Church. And who is she mother of? All the Protestant churches. But also, she's mother of all earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Yeah, the church. The Catholic Church killed all the overcomers she could get her hands on. If anyone tried to read a Bible on their own, they would be killed. If anyone uh, translated a Bible into the common language, like Tyndall, they would be killed by the church, by the Catholic Church. And when I saw her, said John, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I believe John marveled because he saw what the church had become. The church, 
that he had begun in righteousness and holiness. So now back to 1 Samuel. And this is important to read this. This is chapter 3 because this is where I'm going to tell you how you can know if you know God or not. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to I Am in the presence of Eli, and the word of I Am was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of I Am, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call, go lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down. And I am called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said again, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know I am. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, do you remember how chapter 2 started? Or chapter, it was uh, 2 verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know I am. So the word of the Lord had not been revealed to them. So, verse 7, I'll read again. Now, Samuel did not yet know I am. The word of I am had not yet been revealed to him. The question is, has the word of I am been revealed to you? I want to tell you a little story. It's it's, um, part of my testimony. This goes all the way back to the time when I had just turned 21 years old. Uh, That was in 1976. I had just dropped out of college. I was in my fourth year. I was a math major. I had always been a good student. But I got into partying and sexual sin. And just decided I wanted to party. So I dropped out of school. And almost immediately... I went across the street from the record store I used to work at to the bookstore. I was reading Hindu philosophy then, and I went to the philosophy section looking for more of that. And in the philosophy section, I saw a book called The New English Bible. And the thought went through my head. I think it was from God. The thought was, you've always heard the truth is in this book. Why don't you buy it and read it and see if it is. And so I did. It was $12. I still remember the price. $12. 12 times 12 is 144. Anyway, I began to read the book and read it daily for about three months. I um, began in uh, Genesis, but I also began in Matthew. So I would read... uh, I would read the New Testament during the day, and I would read the Old Testament at night. Over a period of three months, I had read through the New Testament twice. I was in my third time, and I was up up to the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. And one night, um, let me just backtrack a little bit before I get to this experience. During this time, I had begun to be convicted of sin. Um... And so was beginning to actually implement the law as in a a very limited way because I was beginning to be convicted of sin in my own life. But anyway, this was um, February or March of 1977. I was in my apartment. I lived alone. I was alone. I was reading the Bible, and I don't remember the verse, but I remember I read this verse in the Old Testament, and I said, wait a minute. 
This is the same person who is speaking that I read in the New Testament earlier this day. And I knew that the books were written hundreds of years apart, that the, Moses wrote well before Christ, that the New Testament was written by the disciples after Christ uh, was resurrected. And, but I knew it was the same author. It's like if you read a bunch of books by the same author, you just know how that author talks and you know what it sounds like, what he or she writes like, and you, you recognize it. And so I knew it was the same author, but then I said to myself, well, that's impossible unless God wrote the Bible. When I said those words to myself, the voice of God spoke to me and said, that's right, Glenn, and I want you to teach my word. Boom, my life was changed. The first the first thing I did, the first thing I remember thinking was this. Then I better do what it says. See, the word of the Lord, the word of I am, the word of Jesus was revealed to me. I knew that it was God's word. I knew it was his word. It was revealed to me. And since it was God's word, then I better do what it says. And so my whole life changed. I quit doing the things I was doing. I enrolled in Bible college. Um, second year there, I met my wife. Uh, not She was not at the Bible college, but I met her. We got married that year. We actually asked, we both met Mike Bickle in 1978. And we actually asked him to officiate our wedding. So I wanted to go through that so that you have an understanding of what it means for the word of the Lord to be revealed to you. Now I'm going to continue reading in Samuel now. And I am called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Okay. Eli was old and his eyes were dim. Eli is, of course, a type of the false prophet. The prophet who doesn't walk according to the ways of the Lord. He did not even discipline his sons knowing that they were sexually abusing the women at the temple and also stealing God's sacrifices from those who brought sacrifices there. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And I am came and stood and calling out as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then I am said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tangle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Now remember that prophecy was up in chapter 2. And I will declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God. To blaspheme God is to, to call evil good and good evil. To blaspheme God is to take the holy things of God and offer them to sin. Food sacrificed to idols. I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever. God declares to you, the church, that he is about to punish your house forever. For the iniquity that you should have known because your leaders are blaspheming God. Eli did not restrain them. 
Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of I am, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Now Samuel, I mean Eli, even though he did not speak forth the truth of God, he was not like his sons. He did not commit the sins that his sons did. He was not like Mike Bickle and the others who have been accused of sexually abusing people within their churches. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and I am was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. He used Samuel as a true prophet. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of I am. And I am appeared again at Shiloh, for I am revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh, Shiloh by the word of I am. Chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up the in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies." Bad idea. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of I Am of Hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of I Am came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of I am had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A god has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter. For 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. Now this is very interesting what comes next. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What's the uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety-eight years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband was dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came 
upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Ichabod. In 1993, my wife wrote a letter to Mike Bickle that told him that Ichabod has been written over his church. Mike did not really respond to that and it was shortly after that that we left that church that was 1993 at that time I believe it was called Metro Vineyard Fellowship now some of you are probably saying oh God won't do that God won't judge the church certainly God's not going to sweep the church away to destruction on this coming Easter. Surely not. God would not do that. He's not like that. Really. What did God do to the northern kingdom of Israel? Because they worshipped false gods and they sacrificed their children to Moloch? What did God do to Judah just a little over a hundred years after that because they too fell into the sin of worshiping false gods, including sacrificing their children to Moloch or Baal. Let's see what God has to say about the leaders in Jerusalem. This is Ezekiel chapter 9. Then God cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his waist, and they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. This is the glory of God. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And I am said to him, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, And put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. Prophetically, look now at those who long to be in New Jerusalem, who are looking for the city whose maker is God. Not the earthly city, not the great city, Babylon the Great, of which... Jerusalem, Old Jerusalem, is a part. We don't look to Old Jerusalem. We look to New Jerusalem. We look to the city of God. So pass through the city, through Jerusalem at that time, through those who long for New Jerusalem now, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed in it. Do you sigh and groan? over the abominations committed in your church? Why have you tolerated sin in your church, especially sin in your leaders? And I say to you, to Alan Hood, Wes Martin, Dwayne Roberts, Michael Sullivan, why did you sit under corrupt leadership so long without judging without discerning good and evil. How did that happen? I'm not saying you are complicit in those sins, 
but I am saying you should have discerned, and you didn't. And now, here we are at the end of this age, and you're dealing with corruption in your church that should have been dealt with decades ago. These accusations against Mike Bickle, as testified to, I believe it was Michael Sullivan, there was a woman in 1983 who had the same testimony of what Mike said to her in order to attempt to lure her into sexual sin. That is that his wife was going to die soon and that this woman was to be his next wife. That's what Jane Doe said concerning how Mike approached her in 1996 when she was 19 years old and the relationship la lasted for three years. These men, Alan Hood, Wes Martin, and Dwayne Roberts, all say that they have heard credible evidence from many accusers of a like nature. And so, again, <clears throat> do you sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed in your church among those who say that they want to be the bride of Christ? That they want to be an overcomer of God? That they want to be a servant of the Most High God? Ezekiel 9, verse 5, And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. So this is after the mark has been put on the foreheads of these men who sigh and groan. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Judgment begins at the house of God. The church, the church leaders do not see that we are at the end of this age. The mark of the beast has been implemented to a degree in a tangible way already beginning in the year 2021. You know what I'm talking about. And there is someone on the scene right now who will be reelected, who will fully implement it. And you're dealing with these issues that should have been dealt with decades ago. So they began with the elders who were before the house. They began with the elders. Then he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking and I was left alone, I fell upon my face and cried, O oh Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. Today, this is true for Israel, the church, the guilt of the church of God, that's the house of Israel, and the guilt of the house of Judah, that is the nation state today known as Israel, who is engaged in genocide of the Palestinians under a Zionist regime. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say, I am has forsaken the land and I am does not see. As for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen, with the writing case at his waist, brought back word, saying, I have done as you commanded me. Folks, this is it. This is where we are in time. This is why these sins have now been revealed. I believe that destruction is coming to the church. I believe this is the year 
because what is on the horizon is so horrible, is so terrible, is so abominable that no flesh will be left alive if Jesus does not come soon and glorify his man-child so that this situation can be dealt with. I'm going to end this now. I'm planning right now to do a further study that goes into even more detail about the failure of the current priesthood within the church. You righteous ones, you who do groan over the abominations committed in the church, get ready to flee to the mountains. I've discussed that in the past. I will discuss that more in the future as well. But become grounded in the things that I have said in these last two videos because the time is short. You don't have time to play. You don't have time to ignore this. This is it. Wake up. Be ready to move in a moment's notice.